Hello, this is a test for Indian interpreters. Can you unmute yourself, please? Merci. Yes, it's working yeah, loud and clear. Thank you. We had a little issue, but now it's resolved. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Okay, bye.
Hello and good day. It is Friday, 12 March 2021. My name is Christian Bayer and I'm welcoming you to today's global COVID-19 press conference. We have, as usual, simultaneous interpretation available in the six official UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish and Russian, plus Portuguese and Hindi. Let me now introduce to you the participants present in the room are Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director at WHO's Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Mira Maria van Kerkhove, Technical Lead on COVID-19, Dr. Marianne Simao, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, and finally, Dr. Bruce Aylward, Special Advisor to the Director General and Lead on the ACT, Act, Act Accelerator. Online, we also have Dr. Peter Ben Embrek, WHO expert on food safety and zoonosis, and the international lead of the WHO convened global study on the origins. With this, let me hand over to the Director General, DG. Thank you, thank you, Christian Dankchen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. As countries roll out COVID-19 vaccines, WHO is continuing to keep a close eye on their safety. WHO is aware that some countries have suspended the use of AstraZeneca vaccines based on reports of blood clots in some people who received doses of the vaccine from two batches. This measure was taken as a precaution while a full investigation is finalized. It's important to note that the European Medicines Agency has said there is no indication of a link between the vaccine and blood clots and that the vaccine can continue to be used while its investigation is ongoing. WHO's Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety systematically reviews safety signals and is carefully assessing the current reports on the AstraZeneca vaccine. As soon as WHO has gained the full understanding of these events, the findings and any change to our current recommendations will be communicated immediately to the public. More than 335 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered globally so far. And no deaths have been found to have been caused by COVID-19 vaccines. But at least 2.6 million people have been killed by the virus, and more will continue to die the longer it takes to distribute vaccines as rapidly and as equitably as possible. The access to COVID-19 tools accelerator, which includes COVAX, was launched almost a year ago at the International Vehicle for the equitable distribution of vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. The emergence of new viral variants, the limited supply of vaccines, the lag in uptake of new diagnostics and oxygen, and the lack of funding to support the distribution of these life-saving tools are a major challenge for the global control of the pandemic. Today, WHO has published its new strategy and budget for the ACT Accelerator in 2021. So far, 11 billion US dollars have been committed to the ACT Accelerator, but we still face a funding gap of 22.1 billion US dollars. The longer this gap goes unmet, the harder it is to understand why given it's a tiny fraction of the more than 13 trillion dollars the IMF estimates that high-income countries have spent on fiscal stimulus to date. We urge countries to fully finance the ACT Accelerator as the best investment in the global recovery. Today, WHO gave emergency use listing to Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine, making it the fourth vaccine to receive WHO's approval. 
Emergency use listing is the green light for a vaccine to be procured and rolled out by COVAX. As you know, the J&J &J vaccine is the first to be listed as a single dose regime. WHO will convene its strategic advisory group on immunization experts next week to formulate recommendations on the use of this vaccine. As new vaccines become available, we must ensure they become part of the global solution and not another reason some countries and people are left further behind. We hope that this new vaccine will help to narrow vaccine inequalities and not deepen them. The COVAX facility has booked 500 million doses of the J&J &J vaccine, and we look forward to receiving them as soon as possible. Health workers and older people all around the world need this vaccine. COVAX is ready to deliver it, and countries are ready to roll it out. In total, COVAX has now delivered almost 29 to 30 million doses of vaccine to 38 countries. Globally, 335 million doses of vaccine have been administered in 144 economies. 76% of those are in 10 countries. The inequitable distribution of vaccines remains the biggest threat to ending the pandemic and driving a global recovery. As I said last week, one of the major challenges we need to solve is how to dramatically increase production of vaccines. This week, WHO and our COVAX partners met with industry representatives and other stakeholders to identify issues and solutions. Manufacturing any vaccine requires a lot of supplies, including gas vi glass vials and plastic filters and the raw materials needed to make them. The sudden increase in demand for vaccine production has led to a shortage of this and other supplies, which is limiting the production of vaccines for COVID 19 and could put the supply of routine childhood vaccines at risk. Some countries have imposed legal restrictions on the export of critical supplies. This is putting lives at risk around the world. We call on all countries not to stockpile supplies that are needed urgently to ramp up production of vaccines. In a global pandemic, no country can go it alone. We're all interdependent. And no country can simply vaccinate its way out of this pandemic. We cannot end the pandemic anywhere unless we end it everywhere. The longer the virus circulates, the higher the chances that variants will emerge that make vaccines less effective. But variants don't make physical distancing less effective. They don't make hand hygiene, masks, ventilation, and other public health measures less effective. We must continue to do it all. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. This we're opening the floor uh, for questions from the media. Let me remind you, uh, in order to ask a question or put yourself on the queue, raise your hand. We already have a good list of um, hands up. Um, and then when I call upon you, please don't forget to unmute yourself. So with this, we're starting with the first question. This, go, this goes to Nina Larsen from AFP. Nina, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, I was I was wondering on the uh, approval today of uh, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, you've been promised 500 million doses. How 
quickly do you expect those those to arrive? Are they already ready to go? Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much for the question about the uh, important new development today with the announcement of the WHO emergency use listing of the Johnson Johnson vaccine. With this product now, we have not only an expanded armamentarium of vaccines to use against uh, the COVID-19 virus, but we also have a vaccine that is even better suited to some of the uh, countries that are worst hit and uh, affected by this, uh, by, the, by the pandemic, because this is a vaccine, as you've seen, that can be used with a single dose, doesn't require the same ultra cold chain requirements, et cetera. So we are very keen to get this uh, into uh, the program and into use as rapidly as possible. As uh, you know, COVAX has an agreement for over uh, 500 million doses of this product. What we're trying to do is work with the company to bring that forward as early as possible. Um, and we're hoping by at least July that we have access to doses that we can be rolling out, if not even earlier. Marianne, you may want to add. Now, just a quick uh, information, thank you, Nina, that uh, WHO's advisory group, strategic advisory group on immunization will be assessing the, the recommendations for the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on Monday. So this is another welcome uh, news. And also the, the fact that the uh, J&J has already announced that it's expanding its manufacturing capacity to other countries, including developing countries also. It's good news in terms of uh, not short term, but in mid and long term, it's good news for the provision to the COVAX facility. Thank just to add very briefly again and to re-emphasize uh, the point made by the Director General that the WHO welcomes uh, any company that would like us to support or help in any way the expansion of the manufacturing capacity, either in terms of fill and finish, if there is already bulk production. Uh, our partners in COVAX, CEPI, have identified fill and finish capacity that is immediately available to any company that would like to use it to expand supplies. And, and then potentially also, of course, for further technology transfer agreements. So we are ready and willing to help J&J uh, and, and any other company that would need our support. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will also make the findings of the uh, SAGE meeting on Monday public, most likely on Wednesday. We'll give a statement out about this. The next question goes to Jason Bobian from NPR. Jason, please unmute yourself. Great. Can you hear me okay? Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd uh, like to follow up on the AstraZeneca situation. Um, can, can you just be a little bit more clear about exactly what your position is on this? Is it similar to the European Medicines Agency, which is that people should just continue using it, or do you support some of the pause that's going on? And also, can you sort of clarify the difference between uh, the AstraZeneca that is being used through COVAX and the AstraZeneca that is being distributed in, in Europe uh, coming from different manufacturing facilities. Thank you, Jason. Dr. Simon, please. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, and, and you know that we have an active surveillance system for safety in adverse events of, of, of uh, following immunization. It's very active and we're working across all uh, all regulatory uh, networks in the world. So it's WHO does rely on EMA information, but WHO also has a global advisory committee on vaccine safety, and this advisory committee is already assessing the data that has been, uh, has been provided by the European medicines agencies and by the countries as we speak. And uh, so WHO is very much aligned with the position that uh, that we should continue immunization until we have uh, clarified the causal relationship. And just to remind everyone, because people die every day, and we have more than 300 million people who have 
taken the vaccines, uh, have been immunized globally. So uh, there will be people who have been immunized who will die of other causes. You know, and this is so far the, the pre preliminary data we have seen doesn't lead to a causal relationship because what we see that it's not different from the the the. the how do you say, how do you, uh, the thromboembolic, which is a disease, a clot, blood clotting disease, uh, event, the, the percentage of what we have seen, it's not different from what uh, it's seen in the general population, the deaths and the occurrence of these events. So this is being uh, investigated as we speak, and we'll probably have an, a statement on this uh, mid next week as the investigations are concluded. Thank you very much, Dr. Simon. We move to the next, that's Catherine Fiancon from France 24. Catherine, unmute yourself, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Christian. Nice to hear your voice. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I would like to come back on the AstraZeneca vaccines and the countries that have decided um, to stop using it. I would, if I remember well, um, WHO and EU did recommend um, the AstraZeneca vaccines that were manufactured in India and in Korea. So I'd like to know if the other um, sites where the vaccine is produced has have been uh, investigated or checked by your experts and. I'd like to know if um, the, the, the batches um, are coming from the same, the batches that were used in the eight or nine countries um, are coming from the same uh, site. Thank you. Thank you. Also... Sorry, that goes to Dr. Simao, please. And, and I apologize, Jason, because I forgot to, to respond to that second part of your question. And now we have, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, we're talking at the moment about two batches that are produced in Europe. Okay, so, so this is important because it's important to clarify that the, the COVAX facility is distributing vaccines that are produced in India by the Seren Institute of India and from uh, the Republic of Korea producer SK Bio. We have had lots of requests today to, to clarify this. So these batches were being used only in some countries in Europe. So they are not the same batches. They are not being used elsewhere. Uh, so it, it, we're talking about the two batches. I don't have the information right now whether they come from the same manufacturer, but they are manufactured in Europe. And like I said before, this, we're still checking and investigating if there is a causal relationship or not. So some of the countries have suspended just the use of these batches, not all the, the vaccination. And some other countries have suspended the vaccination, but it's related to specific batches. Thank you. And Dr. Swaminathan, please. You know, just to make the point that um, adverse events following immunization obviously are uh, very important and uh, the public, you know, is, is keen to know because um, uh, it, it affects their own um, uh, perceptions and the uptake of the vaccine. So I think it's important to put in perspective the adverse events which are reported after vaccination have to be seen in the context of events which occur naturally in the, in the population. As Dr. Simao was saying, there is a background rate for all of these things. You know, people get sick, people get event, uh, serious uh, illnesses, people die every day due to a variety of, of causes. And so there is a background rate for each of these illnesses, you know, whether it's the thromboembolic events or pulmonary embolism or uh, nerve palsy, you know, Bell's palsy, um, or other neurological diseases, or in fact, you know, uh, deaths. We know what the normal rate is. And so when uh, the WHO subcommittee on vaccine safety or any of the regulatory agencies look at the relationship, they look to see whether there is a, a trend of, uh, of an unusual pattern of events occurring with a vaccine. And they also look to see whether there's a causal relationship between receiving the vaccine and, and, and the event. And so it, it is quite important to, to explain also to people 
that um, just because it's reported following a vaccination, it doesn't mean that it's because of the vaccination. It could be completely unrelated. And it's reported because people are keeping a close watch on those who are vaccinated. The pharmacovigilance systems that Dr. Simao talked about uh, and the reporting systems are making sure that it's being reported on those who are vaccinated. But again, it's important to then do the proper full investigations uh, uh, before we, we react and, and to explain to people uh, in a very transparent and open manner what is happening and, and explain uh, when it becomes really something concerning. Thank you. Thank you very much both. With this we come to uh, Jamil Shad from UL Brazil. Jamil, please unmute yourself. Yes, Christian, can you hear me? Very well, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chedros, uh, last week uh, you mentioned the case of Brazil, that you were worried. Since then, uh, uh, cases only rose. Uh, record day by day are beaten, both of deaths and uh, cases. My question to you, uh, is Brazil a sort of a sanitarian threat today to the region and to the world? And what else can be done uh, uh, to stop this uh, situation. Thank you very much. Dr. Ryan, please. Yeah, uh, Maria, my supplement. Uh, certainly the situation in uh, Brazil has worsened. Uh, there's a very high incidence of cases and, and increasing in, uh, death incidents uh, across the country. Uh, certainly a very, very rapid increase in ICU bed occupancy with, with many areas uh, uh, around the country. Uh, uh, running out of 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 of, of ICU beds, and uh, interestingly, Amazonas actually improving situation with ICU beds as the the wave passes through and the health system recovers. Other parts of the system and other parts of the country are coming under extreme threat. The Midwest and South regions uh, have bed occupancy, ICU bed occupancy, more than 96 percent. So 96 out of 100 ICU beds are occupied. Uh, there's very little. Uh, resilience and capacity left in the system. There's also, a, um, worryingly, a, a, an increase in, in positivity of uh, cases, especially people with severe acute respiratory illness. Uh, the, the, the proportion of them testing positive for COVID-19 is going up, and a significant increase in the case fatality rate, the number of people dying who present with illness, uh, which uh, will reflect the pressure on the system and the lack of time that uh, healthcare professionals have. But we also, in the back of our minds, also have the constant concern regarding transmissibility and the inherent virulence or lethality of the virus itself. Uh, Maria may speak to how we're, we're tracking that. Uh, Brazil is a, is, is a great nation and, a, and an important anchor uh, in in South America, in the Americas, and globally. Uh, what ma happens in Brazil matters, and it matters globally. Uh, and Brazil has always been a, a very positive example of strong public health action, one of the first countries in the world to eliminate measles as a public health problem, one of the first countries in the world to eliminate polio. Um, uh, so uh, there's no question. Uh, what happens positively in important and prominent nations matters globally, and what happens negatively in such nations also matters. Uh, we certainly uh, uh, would like to see Brazil going um, in a different direction, uh, but it's going to take a huge effort for that to happen. The system is, cons is considerably pressurized right now, and uh, it, while many, many countries in Central and South America are moving in a good direction, uh, Brazil is not. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, it, the DG said it, that this needs to be taken very seriously in Brazil. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, Brazilian health and Brazilian science and the Brazilian people can turn this around. Uh, the issue is, can they get the support that they need to be able to do that? Uh, Maria can speak to what we know, or increasingly know about particularly the P1 variant in Brazil. With that in mind, all variants of concern are important nationally, and all variants of concern are relevant globally, because we don't call them variants of concern because of their national impact. 
we call them variants of concern because they have potential implications beyond national borders. Maria? Thanks, Mike. Yes, that's right. So um, the P1 variant, um, the variant uh, that is circulating in Brazil is of concern because it has a number of mutations that confer increased transmissibility. And there are some studies that suggest that there is increased transmissibility associated with this P1 uh, variant. And that is important because the more cases that you will have, the more cases that will require care and need hospitalization. And in a situation in, in many states that are already overwhelmed uh, and overburdened, um, that will put more pressure on the system and there could potentially be more deaths associated with that. There are several studies underway of this P1 variant, this virus that has these different mutations, looking to quantify transmissibility and looking to quantify severity. There are some suggestions of increased severity as well. But again, that complicates uh, a system and states that are already overwhelmed from a lot of transmission to begin with. Um, I should say uh, what we do know about the P1 variant, as well as what we know about the B117, the variant that was first identified in the United Kingdom, and the B1351, the variant that was first identified in South Africa, the public health and social measures, the physical distancing, the masks, the hand hygiene, the ventilation, and the IPC measures that are put in place in health facilities as well as outside of health facilities work against these virus variants. And we have seen in a number of countries the application of these individual level measures, the community level measures, um, the diagnostics still work. These are driving transmission down. And so it's, it's still, these virus variants still can be controlled. Complicates matters if you have a virus that is that spreads more easily, but they still can be controlled. WHO, uh, we expect uh, that there will be more virus uh, mutations. We expect that the virus will continue to evolve, which is why we have put a system in place to track uh, evolution, to track these mutations. And this has been in place since the beginning of this pandemic, more than 14 months ago. Um, and that uh, tracking system has grown into a global monitoring and assessment framework that includes many different elements, first starting with surveillance, making sure we have good epidemiologic surveillance, we have strong virologic testing, we're using PCR testing, we're using antigen-based tests uh, in countries so we know where the virus is. We take a subset of those and those are sequenced so we can look at the different mutations within countries. We are working with our regional offices and the regional platforms that have been established to enhance sequencing surveillance around the world. We're leveraging our flu system, the GISRA system, which has labs in 150 countries, leveraging HIV, TB, uh, polio networks, uh, labs that are doing sequencing so that they can also be doing sequencing for SARS-CoV-2. And not only the sequencing itself, making sure that those sequences plus supporting data about the epi, about the clinical, can be uploaded to platforms like GISAID so that analysis can be done to understand the evolution. Um, we are also working with our partners as part of this global risk assessment framework to evaluate transmissibility of each of these variants of interest as well as the variants of concern to understand any impact on, on increases in transmissibility, transmissibility as well as severity. And we're linking with partners around the world to coordinate studies that need to be done to evaluate the impact on, potent, on uh, available and future diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. This framework will inform um, vaccines uh, composition um, if any changes need to be made um, for vaccines, for therapeutics, and also for diagnostics. So it's a huge system that is in place. It involves partners all over the world it involves, um, uh, we're not starting from scratch because we're e enhancing and, and um, strengthening uh, existing systems that are in place, but we know there are gaps. Sequencing is a big gap right now because uh, not every country is able to do this. And in fact, most of the sequences that have been shared on platforms like GISAID, I didn't check today, but there are more than 600,000 full genome sequences that have been shared. Um, those come from a handful of countries. So we need more countries to be doing sequencing of the, the viruses in their country, but this needs to be intelligent. Not every case needs to be sequenced. We need to look at which uh, cases uh, need to be sequenced. Perhaps they are cases that are involved in a cluster, or they are cases that are involved in uh, uh, maybe the, the disease presentation may be slightly different. So we've outlined guidance on which cases should be sequenced, and we're working with our partners to make sure that 
all of this information informs different trigger uh, decision making points. But as I said, right now, the public health and social measures, the infection prevention and control, our diagnostics, our vaccines work against these virus variants. And so it's really important that we continue to drive transmission down. We prevent as many infections as we can to begin with. And we still, if we are infected, we take measures to prevent uh, transmission mm -hmm. onward. Director General. Maybe a bit, uh, I just would like to add a bit. Uh, I have been to Brazil a number of times, and um, actually the Brazilian system, I have already, health system, I've already considered it as a model uh, because, uh, the, you know, of its strong emphasis on primary health care. And I think many people know about their family health teams and I remember from my visits how they map their uh, areas uh, of responsibility and even marking each and every household and they know who is, uh, who has what uh, health problems by, by household. And the number of times I visited, I always prefer to go to the clinics to see how the family health teams work. And because of that, I actually expected that the um, Brazilian health system could even perform better because, you know, strong community-based approaches uh, can fare better in, in, in outbreaks because uh, that could have strong surveillance system identifying early and addressing them. So it's really puzzling to see now that it's actually contrary to our expectations. Um, and the situation um, is uh, very concerning. Uh, we're deeply concerned, actually, because just not just the cases, number of cases, but the number of deaths is also increasing. So to, to have a dent on the uh, transmission uh, to make a significant impact there should be very serious uh, social uh, measures that, that should be that should be taken and with the participation of the community and there should be clear messages from the authorities on how the, what the situation is and what measures should take and enforce uh, those those measures with full participation of the health system and the population unless serious measure is taken the upward uh, trend, which is now flooding the health system and which is becoming beyond its capacity, uh, will result in more uh, deaths. Uh, I think um, was yesterday's data I was looking at had already crossed 2,000 deaths per day. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's getting very serious. And I think uh, starting from the government, all stakeholders should, should really take it seriously. Uh, I said it last time, Brazil neighbors many countries in Latin America, almost all of them except a couple. And some countries are doing better in the neighborhood. But if the situation in Brazil continues to be serious like this, then the neighboring countries will be affected. And it's not about the neighboring countries, but it could go even, even, even beyond. And uh, this virus, unless it's suppressed everywhere, there will always be some threshold somewhere that will allow it to continue. And with changing variants, even the risk could be, could be higher. Uh, so um, I think um, all three of us said this, situation is deeply concerning and the measures that should be taken should be as serious as, as, as possible uh, in order to have some significant progress. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Thank you all. With this, we move to uh, Simon Nateba from today's News Africa. Simon, please unmute yourself. Thank you for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. You seem to be saying that the AstraZeneca vaccine is generally safe. 
millions of people have taken it, and a few negative reactions should not lead to hasty conclusion. I'm just saying this because that's the main vaccine being rolled out in Africa under COVAX, which brings me to my question. Can you give us an update on the vaccine rollout in Africa, and when do we expect all countries in Africa to receive their first doses? Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Let me look around. Uh, Dr. Elliot, is that? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Simon, and, th and thank you for the question. The, uh, y you know, the, the great thing, we probably should have commented on earlier when the question was asked about the J&J &J vaccine. The, the, the great thing uh, that we're finding in the whole area of vaccines and COVID, of course, is that um, so many of the approaches that are being taken, so many of the products that are being developed are proving ultimately to be successful and, and good, effective uh, and safe products in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Um, so we're developing quite a, a broad armamentarium, all of them uh, demonstrating, let's say so far, good uh, efficacy, those ones that have been licensed uh, or, sorry, received emergency use listing um, and, and good uh, good safety profiles. And among these, the AstraZeneca vaccine has, has uh, also stood out as one of the great products that has had a great profile in its use in so many different settings right now. So, uh, Simon, we have great confidence in this product. Of course, when you hear anything about any product that you're giving to healthy populations, you always want to uh, uh, make sure that you uh, you, that, that confidence is well-founded, and, and that's what's happening. But as Mary Angela has already uh, explained, we have strong confidence in this. So in terms of the rollout of COVAX uh, uh, in, in, um, on, on the African continent, it's been uh, very fast. So far, 24 countries um, have, have received vaccine already on the continent from COVAX, over 15 million doses, and this is just in the last two weeks. There's another uh, number in the pipeline that will receive it during the coming week. So we'll be up around 35 uh, countries um, on the continent and closer to 20 million doses. So what we're really focused on now, Simon, is this is a really great start. But as the Director General said, it's, it's just a start because um, there's a lot more than 24 million people on the continent, obviously, and we need to get a lot more vaccine into not just the countries who've already received it, but the ones who are in the pipeline. Now, the good news is of the countries that have not yet received vaccines on the continent, um, almost all of them are now have the indemnification uh, uh, work in place, so the legal frameworks, they've got the regulatory pathways sorted out, they have great plans in place in their countries to take great use of these vaccines. The crucial thing now is making sure that the global supply chain continues to prioritize uh, the COVAX facility so that it can get vaccines equitably distributed to all the countries that need them because we are still lagging when you look at the maps. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad you highlighted, uh, uh, Simon. Um, Africa still has a number of countries that have not yet received vaccines or not yet been able to start vaccination. And that's a situation we have to change very, very quickly. We continue to be deeply concerned about the uh, supply chain globally. Um, as you have seen uh, in, in, in the press and other accounts recently, there's lots of challenges and AstraZeneca has had challenge maintaining its supplies and we need to make sure that uh, despite those challenges, we continue to prioritize uh, getting this vaccine uh, into, uh, into the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ewood. Uh and now we move to Helen Branswell from Start News. Helen, unmute yourself, please. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, my question is about um, Ebola. I wonder if you have any, any points you can make about the um, reports that the uh, virus has been in, isolated from Guinea. <laughs> I don't know where it means what it's coming from. It's not much. Helen, you have a very Hello. bad sound in the background. Mm -hmm. Let me go to another question, and we come back to you right after this, and, and maybe you can sort this in the meantime. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, let me call upon Ketevan Kadava for now. Um, Ketevan, uh, please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Mm, uh, we have finally mm, good news from Georgia. 
uh, first patches of uh, vaccine we will receive tomorrow and um, from next week we will be ready to start vaccination and we are very happy. Uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. Tedros for your personal commitment and for your support. Uh, before and this vaccine will be AstraZeneca a vaccine and uh, I have a question about uh, uh, AstraZeneca again, um, because uh, um, there are some doubts uh, uh, in Georgia. Um, so what can you uh, recommend um, people uh, uh, who are going to vaccinate um, against COVID-19 and assessment of the situation in Georgia? Thank you very, very much. Yeah, we had it similar, but uh, Dr. Swami, now turn, please. So just to reiterate again that, you know, we're looking very closely at the safety data, and so is the European Medicines Agency, and we're working closely with them, analyzing the information that's coming from these, uh, these reports. I think I just want to remind everyone of what the, the DG said, which is that COVID has killed over 2.6 million people so far globally, just the known and documented deaths. We believe that there must be more than that. And um, of the 330 million vaccines, uh, doses that have been deployed, we are not aware of any one confirmed COVID vaccine related death. There have been deaths following vaccination in people, but people die of diseases every day. So there hasn't been a single confirmed uh, and, and the, most of the vaccinations to date have been done in countries with very good safety monitoring and pharmacovigilance systems, the high-income countries. So there's very good reporting, and, and each of these reports is being amplified in the press. So I think it's very important to reassure people, uh, especially in the countries uh, that the vaccines are just being rolled out in. This is a time when we want people to take the vaccines that are available, because all the vaccines approved till date do prevent severe disease and hospitalization, and they're definitely preventing people from dying of COVID-19. And that's what we want. And so I think it's key that public health officials in all countries that are vaccinating or beginning to vaccinate must amplify the right messages based on the available science. And as the science and knowledge evolves, things could change. I mean, we have to keep our uh, eyes and ears open, and we will keep communicating to you as, as things happen. But as of now, we are confident that we should go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ketevan, for this uh, opportunity to reiterate this important point. Now we'll try again with uh, Helen Branswell, and sorry for the disturbance before. Helen, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Christian. I don't know where that music was coming from, but it wasn't coming from my end. Um, I wanted to ask about a report that has uh, come out about the um, Ebola viruses uh, causing the outbreak in Guinea. An analysis has been done of this uh, sequence data, and it shows that there's only about 12 to 14 nucleotide differences from the virus from the 2014-2016 outbreak, which is a very stunning thing to see at this point. I was hoping y y Mike might be able to uh, explain what the thinking is about what's going on there. Thank you. Uh. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a, it's 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 it, it, the, we were aware of the report and very grateful to the the, the, the different groups who've done this sequencing and done such good analysis. Uh, and in, in that sense, the the results are are, are quite uh, remarkable. I mean that the branch the branch ancestral to this cluster uh, is very very similar to the original virus that caused the outbreak 2014 to 16 far much less than would be uh, that you would expect uh, uh, based on the evolutionary rate of the virus at, that it displayed at that time. Uh, Bruce is here and he, he knows how, how quickly that virus evolved. Um, the, in a sense, what this really says, Helen, and we have to be very careful here because there's more studies are going to be needed, but certainly um, this is unlikely uh, uh, right now, based on the genetic sequencing, to be linked to be linked to a fresh zoonotic reservoir, uh, and much more likely uh, to be linked to persistence uh, uh, or, or latency of infection uh, 
uh, in, a, in a human subject. And uh, that would be uh, probably the, the longest period of time that such a, an event between such two events. Now, that I'm, I'm, I'm cautioning here. These are the first results, and there's more studies that are needed. Um, uh, and again, it's great to have this data, but in, in that sense, we're not dealing, as far as we understand right now, with the, uh, a breach of the, the species barrier. Um, it really does speak to the importance of uh, following up <clears throat> and supporting <clears throat> survivors and finding better ways to help survivors. And again, let me uh, say this again, the vast majority of people who survive Ebola clear the virus from their system and they recover within six months an even tinier proportion of people end up potentially carrying the virus. They're not infectious to other people except in very particular circumstances. Uh, and a tiny proportion of them can relapse in their infection uh, and become sick again. Um, and even in those, the, 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 the percentage of those people who have the hemorrhagic symptoms are, is less. So uh, it's very important that we follow up survivors to support them. But it's extremely important at this moment because these are scientific results. But ultimately, there are people at the heart of this. And there are thousands of people who have survived uh, Ebola in West Africa. And lives, their lives have been put back together. Uh, they have suffered hugely, and so have their communities. So it's extremely important as we look at the scientific data that we do not allow any form of stigmatization uh, around this subject. Uh, survivors deserve our support. They've been to hell and back. Their families have been to hell and back. Uh, we need to better understand how this, uh, um, how this happened. It's really important for the future. But just to reassure, survivors of Ebola do not represent a threat to their communities uh, or to their families. Uh, we have a duty to them to follow them up properly, to ensure they get access to the right care, and to do everything possible to find new ways of ensuring we can clear infections in those very, very few people who may carry the virus for a longer period of time. But you're right, Alan, uh, the, it is a remarkable result. It's a testament to the scientists who work on this in Guinea and around the world. And just to, to remind everyone, we, WHO uh, has, has launched a, a, a readiness and, and response plan for all of the surrounding countries, including Guinea, working with their partners and with the governments to uh, to uh, bring this disease under control. Uh, we have 18 uh, cases uh, there at the moment, uh, and uh, we, we now have uh, over 30,000 doses of, of vaccine in the field. Uh, we've vaccinated uh, a large number of contacts and contacts of contacts. We'd like to pay testament to the leadership of the Ministry of Health in, uh, and the President in Guinea, and particularly to Dr. Sakoba for his leadership at the national level. Uh, we encourage all partners to work under the coordination of Dr. Sakoba, Dr. Sakoba and, the, and the UN system in order that we can deliver the best uh, services uh, on the ground. Um, we have vaccinated uh, nearly 3,000 individuals so far in a targeted ring vaccination. We don't vaccinate the whole population, we vaccinate contacts contacts of those contacts. It's a very targeted uh, vaccination along social and contact networks. It was highly successful in the last outbreaks in Congo. Uh, and we're making very good progress with that right now. Uh, again, this, causes, this disease causes fear in communities. And again, those communities in West Africa who went through the horrors of the West Africa outbreak uh, deserve our support now, first and foremost, to stop this virus dead in its tracks, but two, to support them at the community level in terms of dealing with the fear and the, uh, the genuine fear uh, that they have around this disease potentially spreading. I don't know, Bruce, you have the, you have the institutional memory for this uh, uh, West, the West Africa and, and did so much in your leadership role there. You may have a comment as well. Helen, we'll be very happy to follow up with you with more details. Uh, and Dr. Pierre Fomonti leads on the technical mm -hmm. side here. Dr. Salam Gay is our regional emergency director, and I think we have Michel Yao online. Michel is not with us. Oh. Uh, well, Michel is embedded. He's in, um, in uh, Guinea and is working very, very closely with Dr. Sokoba under his leadership. So, Bruce, you may have a comment to make. I don't know.
Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Helen, for, for the comment. I think Mike really hit the nail on the head. In, in the West Africa uh, Ebola outbreak, we learned so much. Um, you know, it's interesting. We'd known this disease for dozens of years at that point. This was a new environment. It was a whole new scale uh, as well. And um, one of the things we learned, as Mike highlighted, was just how there could be pers persistence and longer-term shedding than we'd originally uh, realized of the virus. Um, it was also one of the first, uh, the first uh, outbreak, if I remember correctly, where we were able to actually apply molecular tools in real time. That was really toward the end of the uh, of the crisis to help us understand how it was evolving, how to tackle it, and also manage some of the risks. And in that uh, vein, I would want to reinforce a little bit what Mike has said. This is some new results that we've just seen, and the biggest mistake we could make would be to jump conclusions about what this means about the outbreak and its evolution and the risk. We know how to tackle this disease very, very well, and I tell you, in West Africa, in Guinea, in this area where I spend a lot of time with uh, Dr. Sagoba and the colleagues, these people really know what they're doing when it comes to managing this disease. And uh, I think we will understand in the near term what the uh, genetic results that we're seeing mean. But again, uh, the important thing is we have the tools we need to tackle this. We have a community that knows how to tackle this, and we have new tools. And I think we just need to be careful that we don't overinterpret what is the evolving information. Um, we made a couple of mistakes in that regard in West Africa back in uh, uh, back uh, three, four years ago, and we don't need to do that again. So thanks for raising it, though. Super important that we have this discussion. Thank you very may, much. May, may I oh. just add that uh, donor countries out there may consider supporting the government of Guinea and the surrounding countries as they implement these uh, response plans. Uh, to date, the, everyone, I know it's very tough. There are so many issues out there for, for donors to consider. And not least of which in Yemen and, 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 and Tigray and so many other uh, desperate uh, tragedies and also COVID. Uh, but uh, the Ebola outbreak uh, is one, and we've seen in the past, if Ebola is left to burn slowly, it can, it can quietly expand and it can cause a problem. Prevention is the best cure in this particular case. We saw the investment in preparedness in Uganda last year. We saw the value of that. Uganda ended up with two importations of disease. It had no secondary cases. It nailed it. It absolutely did the right thing, and so did the other surrounding countries. Now we need to make sure that the countries surrounding Guinea and Guinea itself have the resources. Uh, and what we've seen is a remarkable increase in human capacity and technological capacity in, in countries, in Africa in particular. Um, what they sometimes need is quick resources in order to be able to scale up the response. And WHO is out there asking countries to consider funding this regional plan to, to contain this disease in support of the ministries, and we'll be delighted to provide more information on that in the coming days. Christian, sorry to jump in again, but Mike made this comment earlier that the people who've suffered this disease have been to hell and back, and their families have. And this is this virus is really the uh, you know a devil of a virus, to use Mike's uh, metaphor. And uh, that support to Guinea, which can easily be forgotten at this time, is going to be absolutely vital. These people know what they're doing, but they're going to need the support to be able to implement, especially in the areas where are being hit. These are some of the most vulnerable and uh, needy areas. No, thank you, Drs. Ryan and Aylward, for this very important appeal to the donor community. With this, we move to Naomi O'Leary from the Irish Times. Naomi, please unmute yourself. Hi, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, my question is about um, the um, what, how much of a concern are U.S. restrictions on vaccine exports, um, given its importance in manufacturing, particularly the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but also the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there are reports that tens of millions of doses are already stockpiled, uh, ready to go, but not being exported anywhere. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Naomi. Let me give a quick look around and Dr. Simao, Let please. Let me start. <laughs> um, as, as we mentioned previously in, in pressers, WHO is always very concerned about export bans uh, on products that will help to, to end the, uh, the acute phase of this pandemic. And this is, is related also to, to the vaccines, to the ingredients to, to produce vaccines and to 
any other products, and we have seen an increased uh, move from some countries in putting bans or restrictions on uh, exporting goods that are actually very much needed uh, globally at this point. So WHO very much discourages uh, the use of, of this type of measure to, to that, that can decrease the, 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 uh, the, the chances that we achieve better and more equitable access to vaccines around the world. And maybe someone else wants to. Dr. Aylward, please. Uh, thank you, Christian. Naomi, thanks for the point. One of the, uh, or the question, one of the great uh, things about this uh, uh, response and now that the vaccines are being available has been the emphasis of every country, every manufacturer to ensure that no vial uh, lays idle. And in fact, that's a bit the theme that we're hearing again and again. And as people look at where vaccines can be best used, people are talking to us about how they could make donations. This goes back almost to December. And as the Director General has been calling for, um, we've been pushed very hard uh, from the COVAX side to ensure that any vial that comes to us will be used and put to work immediately. And that is really the mantra we're trying to drive right throughout the entire uh, uh, response is that every vial of vaccine, as it comes off, as it becomes available off the production lines, that is immediately put to work. And the fantastic thing has just been the attention uh, around the world to that. There's always going to be in situations where you end up with some vaccine getting uh, held or maybe not rolled out as rapidly as possible. But everybody recognizes the need to be working uh, to the common good of getting all of these to work as rapidly as possible. The great thing now, the COVAX facility has been up. It's been delivering for, uh, for over two weeks now, and I think everybody's seen it's moving vaccines uh, and moving the orders, the demand, and getting them into people even faster than the manufacturers can, uh, can keep up with. So if anyone does have vials, and I only bag there on their shelves, uh, we can put them to good work. Thank you very much for this. Uh, now we move to Latika Mbuk from the Sydney Morning Herald. Latika, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Um, just asking about uh, Italy's decision to block with the authorization of the EU uh, AstraZeneca vaccines to Australia. One of the reasons cited was that Australia has a very low outbreak and that Europe needs those vaccines more. Is that a fair enough reason, in your view, to block the export of vaccines? Let's start with Dr. Ilva, please. Thanks, uh, and, and thank you for the question. Um, at the beginning of this crisis, uh, we had to sit down and, as the vaccines were being developed, uh, put together a framework for how to ensure their optimal use as they rolled out the equitable and, and, uh, and fair allocation of these products. And Dr. Mary Angela Samao has led that work and would be a good person to comment it. But it was, as, as we looked at how do we roll these things out as fairly and equitably as possible, um, and we looked at the threat and the risks uh, around the world, and we're dealing with a virus which is distributed um, ubiquitously, right? It, it's all over the world at the point and at the same time we have older populations we have healthcare workers all over the world so the people who are vulnerable who are going to be most highly exposed most at risk of severe disease also distributed so um, what we're looking at is how do we reduce that risk of severe disease and with it the risk of uh, death obviously but also the risk of ICUs getting clogged so what we're trying to do is ensure we roll these vaccines out everywhere around the world because every country has populations at our risk every country needs access to these products. So um, that is what underpins the strategy uh, behind the rollout of these products and the reason that we give such emphasis to ensuring every country has access to these. Every country has healthcare workers, every country has uh, older populations. And as we've seen as well, although a situation may look quiet in one country or another, um, it can explode very, very rapidly, right? We've seen countries with very few cases all of a sudden reporting uh, uh, hundreds within days. And so for that situation, you want to make sure that you've reduced that risk everywhere to the degree possible. I don't know if Mary Angela wants to add. Uh, just a, a quick comment, because we, we, we are also always pushing that that this 
this virus is present everywhere, right? And that the risk of outbreaks, even in situations where it's under, apparently under control, has been proven over and over again that it can happen again. So the, it, it, no one is, is safe yet, right? And so it's needed, you know? We need to prior, prioritize the vaccination for, like Bruce said, for the older groups and for healthcare workers and people who are at risk of dying. And we are talking about it across the world in all countries. And Dr. Ryan, please. Just on, on Australia, and, and I think it's a, probably a good lesson for, for many of us. Uh, Australia had two peaks uh, in transmission uh, in daily peaks. They, they never exceeded 1,000 cases a day. Australia's had less than 30,000 cases overall, less than 1,000 deaths. The last peak was last July. Uh, Australia f not only flattened that curve, it destroyed that curve and it has kept it at that really low level since. That didn't happen by accident. That didn't happen because of luck. That happened because the Australian government applied a comprehensive strategy to suppress this virus, to track contacts, to test, to test, to test. And they went after this virus uh, in a way, a, rem a way that uh, uh, was just a truly impressive as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a public health operation. And it was done in the face of a lot of criticism at the time. And there were good days and bad days. And there were, there were genuine dilemmas at community level. And there were many times when I think Australia took very severe action in response to a very small number of cases, small clusters, very big responses. But I think there are some real lessons to learn from the experience of Australia. For Australia though right now, because they've managed to do just that, the zero prevalence of this disease is very low. So the Australian population remain overwhelmingly susceptible to this virus because they have been protected by their government, protected by their public health system, uh, protected by the strategy that was used by Australia. Um, in my view, I'm not comparing countries, but that success in protecting your population should not result in you lacking access to that, uh, which will give more permanent protection to that population. But I think it's, a, it's an important reflection to look at just, and I would point many countries to look at Australia's experience um, uh, uh, and how, how to contain, suppress, and a lesson for the future, uh, I think, as we move forward. Vaccines alone will not be the answer. I think we need to use vaccines and then look at the strategies that implemented by countries like Australia and New Zealand. For me, the magic is bringing equitable access to vaccines together with comprehensive public health strategies. You put those two together, we'll make this pandemic history. Uh, so um, I do hope that Australia can access the vaccines from whatever source they can. But uh, I must say, chapeau, they've really shown us all how to use public health. Uh, to, to kill a virus. Thank you very much. And with this, we come to the end of our briefing. We're already over one hour, and we actually made it to nine questions, which is extremely good. Thank you all very much. And before I hand back to Dr. Tedros for the final words, let me remind you again that the, uh, uh, the comments will be posted on the, will be sent right after this briefing. And of course, uh, the uh, full transcript will be posted tomorrow morning on the WHO website during the day. And if for any other follow-ups, please send an email to media inquiries. Thank you. Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, thank you for joining us today and uh, bon weekend and see you next week. <laughs>